All right, everybody. I'm so happy to see you today. Here bright and early on a Saturday morning, ready to go. Hopefully you had your coffee and uh, eating an extra donut to have some energy. So thank you for joining me today. And uh, I did appreciate going out into the schools. I did get a chance to see several people on walkthroughs um, this week. We did some spring, uh, a lot of springboard walkthroughs through middle and high. So I didn't see everybody, but we did see some people, and I did appreciate that. And thank you, because I know it was in your class. So appreciate that. And that provided a lot of insight. And I did go back, actually, based on those walkthroughs and edit my presentation to put in you know, some of the big trends I was seeing and to make sure we had that today. So that was pretty cool. So um, just to start us off, Today's topic is formative assessment. So that's what we'll be talking about today. There's a um, few outcomes that we really want to be able to take away from our learning today. So take a minute and look at those outcomes and annotate them all. What are we going to be learning? Taking your own. We have the boxing, we have the underlining, whatever way you do it in your class is the way I want you to <coughs> demonstrate today. Our first um, outcome for today. Who would tell me what we're going to be doing there? Yes. Uh, we're going to be defining formative assessment. Yes, defining formative assessment. So I want you to notice on the board here, I have I can. By the end of today, if I see that you can do that, I know you have met that outcome. Okay, so as we do these things and as I see these things happen, I may be checking off them throughout the lesson. Okay? Um, let's see, what's the second thing that we really want to be able to walk away with today? Yes, ma'am. Um, describe benefits of formative assessments. So we really want to be able to articulate that, right? Describe those benefits, the why behind that. Okay, great. And, um, uh, articulate how formative assessments can be used in instruction uh, to promote uh, student learning. Right, not just using them, but how can we use them in such a way that the result will be student learn, right? Not just throwing it in there to throw it in, but the when, the where, the why, the how, and how is that going to translate to students actually learning, promoting their learning. Okay, and the last one. All right, so we're going to embed a formative assessment strategy into an upcoming lesson. Okay, so do you see how the learning is progressing as we go? So the very last thing we want to be able to do is what? Apply. Use it, right? Apply it. Um, today's learning would be not very beneficial if you left here not being able to take something away and bring it right to your classroom. So the hope of any learning that we do is that you're able to apply it right away to benefit kids, to promote learning. So we are going to have that time to practice today, embedding it in an upcoming lesson that you will be using this week. So that's going to be really cool because you're going to walk away being able to do this and promote learning in your class as well. So we're going to kind of pay attention to these things as we go, and we're going to monitor our own understanding as we go. So I want you always asking yourself, can I do that yet? Am I able to do that yet? And if so, you know, kind of monitor your own outcomes as we go. So when you feel you have met that objective, flip back and check it off, okay? When you feel you're able to do those things. Let's start off, because I, um, I do believe that some of you may know some of them, right? You, you may have an idea around a couple of these things. Um, so we will start off with an anticipation guide. I want to give you an idea of a snapshot of what we're going to do this morning before we begin. 
we're going to kind of do a little formative assessment ourselves, right? Like, where are we with the ideas of formative assessment? So I'm actually going to give one in here to show you what it looks like and then use the information as we move forward. Um, we're going to develop a good working definition of formative assessment. Um, it's probably, uh, if you ask 10 teachers, you'll get 10 different answers. If you ask 10 people out in the research field, you will probably get 10 different answers. So we want to develop our definition for today's sake of what we're going to um, define it as so when we speak, we can speak in that way. Okay? Also, I'm going to read and annotate and discuss an article. You know, really thinking through what the, that research says for ourselves and be, be able to have discourse around that. We're going to then say, well, what are those teaching implications for me? So after we do a little research, we really want to start thinking about our classroom and what that actually means for us. We're going to look at a little bit of research that's been done around um, formative assessment. But, you know, make sure we have some key points of it so when we're trying to apply it, we keep those things in the back of our mind. And then talk about whether or not it's beneficial for learning. Um, there's some strategies around, you know, about it that really does work. So we want to talk about those strategies and um, really give a lot of examples of formative assessment. We all teach different content, different grade levels, so it's good to have a plethora of ideas that we could make learning fresh with and really use in our classroom. So we're going to explore some of those. And then last but not least, we're going to go ahead and, you know, bring that right down to what we're going to do this week in our lessons and try to embed one or two of those strategies to promote learning. And then we're going to leave with a little reflection and exit ticket to see where we are, what we learned, and you know where we're going to go next on our journey. So that's kind of what you have in store for today, to kind of keep you on track for you know, where we're at in our progression of learning. So you have an anticipation guide in front of you. I want you to find that handout. And um, it's one of your uh, you know, outside of the packet. It says agree or disagree right on top. This is something that I want you to just answer by yourself without you know, conversing with anybody else. Just to see where you are with this. Agree or disagree. Just a quick A or D next to each statement. And then just put it in the folder. Don't need to talk about it. We're just seeing where you are right now in your own thoughts. Some of these are tricky on purpose. <laughs> okay. Make a decision, even if it's tricky, just go ahead and commit to one and then we can see where we go from there. Okay. Looks like everybody at least had that initial statement. Just put in your blue folder, we'll come back to that later. So that's just, I'm going to step out of the learning for a minute. What did I do just now? What is it that I'm doing, and why do you think I'm doing it as an instructor? What is the reason for that anticipation? See, see what you already know, right? Why do you think that's important for me to do, to see what you know? To differentiate instruction that way, so the people who do know something, you can get them to think deeper about what they already know, mm -hmm. and then you can scaffold for those who don't. Right. It's, it's just a great, it's a great thing to know where all your learners are, right? So if I walk around the room and I see that everybody's spot on on every answer, I know what I'm dealing with as far as mindsets coming in. And then like you said, I can just build on your learning and take that learning to the next level. If I walk around and I see some misconceptions, 
I'm looking to see, do I see common misconceptions? Do I have one or two items that are really, you know, problematic with our, you know, where we're coming in? That allows me to know where I need to go and push and be more in doubt. Maybe it's just one or two people who have those misunderstandings. But I'm going to make sure that I pose myself in the right place during my instruction to make sure that that clarity comes at one point in time. So in my mind, I want to know where those people are who have misconceptions, what the larger misconceptions are, so that way throughout my lesson, I will clarify those things to make sure when we walk out of here, we will leave without a shadow of a doubt knowing you know, where all of those fall in the research around formative assessment, okay? So I wanted to point that out. It's a great way to start a class, right? Just kind of a little quick gauge about where you are, students, coming into this information. So that's why we did what we did, and you can think about that for your classroom. Has anybody ever started their classes with some kind of quick way to judge what students know? I'm interested to hear that. Anybody has a way that they've done that before? Entrance tickets. Mm -hmm. Entrance tickets? Lesson starters. Yes, lesson starters. Yes, any other ways? <clears throat> Diagnostic test. Yeah. A diagnostic test, real quick, you know, a couple, maybe a couple one, could be longer, could be a short one, just to see what students know about what you're about to teach. Yeah. That's three or four different ways, and as we go throughout today, you're probably going to learn e even more ways, but you know, we have a lot of technology on our hand, a couple of questions with like a clicker things like that that we can do and real quick throw up the poll this is where we're at with our understanding as it goes you know we can kind of see how we progress and you can know right away which students have it which ones don't and then kind of move forward with it so that's a um that's some awesome techniques right there so with that being said I have some quotes in front of you i want you to take some time and read each of the four things Four quotes about formative assessment. And then I want you to pick one that really resonates with you. Okay? When you pick that one, I want you to think, why does it resonate with you? What we're going to do is in the groups that we have numbered off, uh, I want you to pick up inside of your box, you have a world, an apple, some kind of squishy device. We're going to use this device to do a round robin technique for participation. We don't want any hogs or any logs. We want to make sure that we're all accountable here and that we're all participating. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass this and we're going to have a chance to say, well, I picked this one and this is why it resonated with me. Okay? Take some minutes to think time. Take about a minute to think time. And then we'll person who numbered off, grab that um, squishy, and you're going to start the conversation here today, and you just go ahead and uh, go in clockwise direction as you pass, and each person will have a chance to comment on that quote. Yeah. I chose this one, the one, the one in the back box. <laughs> Because it said that formative assessments nurture hope. Um, a lot of times, students tend to think that whenever they get a test or a quiz, is to set them up to fail for some reason. Like you just want to, you want me to fail. You're constantly trying to like stress me out or whatever. But really and truly, it's to give them hope to say, okay, this is where we're starting, but we have a lot more room to grow. And so I really like that part of what formative assessment should be. 
Yeah. So I've actually got a lot of fun. Then we're going to be in here. Because like, I mean, so I don't see it's on the list. Because this is where it would be. I like to start with the decision. I like to start with the decision. Because like there's always something I just need to do with this. Some of the conversations that we had at the tables. 
Um, different people had different, you know, things that they responded to for different reasons. It also lets me know real insight of where you are with this in, in, in your life. So I really appreciate that. Did anybody hear something that really stands out to them that they want to share? Just any aha, any major thing that somebody said that really resonated with you? We were talking about, um, in our group, the, the long quote um, that says you may not get this yet. And then we were talking about the, the power of the language of mm -hmm. uh, the word yet. So we hear a lot of I can't or I don't understand this. And so um, changing that to, you know, something that, okay, it's, you know, there's hope that it is possible. You will be able to obtain whatever knowledge that is. Yeah. That's such a perfect connection to why we do formative assessment. It, it's hopeful. It's not final. It's not the point in time where the grade is on that paper. It's, I still have time to learn. I still have time to grow. How uplifting is that to know that with this feedback, I can, you know, increase my knowledge. I can get there. So, you know, just changing how we view instruction, changing our outlooks to be really hopeful and having those times to grow, such a, you know, a positive outlook on, on where kids are and where they could be. So, that's wonderful. Anybody else had just something that really stood out in the conversation or they wanted to capture from the larger group that everybody else would, would you know, benefit from? I think something that was said that was really interesting was the teachers getting, or new teachers at least, tend to get in the habit of endlessly teaching um, mm -hmm. instead of focusing more on using that feedback to help the students or actually inform the students about different things that they did and didn't do. Right, right. In the walkthroughs that we did, a collective trend was our teachers are working hard. They are working hard. They are thinking. They are talking. They have planned. They have annotated out those lessons all over the place. But when we listen for student voice and student thinking and student working, not so much. Right? It did happen. But wanted it to happen at a larger scale. Anything you take out of today, the talking brain and the thinking brain is the learning brain. Okay? So you want to shift that ownership to those kids. So you're right, that quote, you know, really does make a lot of sense because we're endlessly teaching, but do we have that learning, right, actually transferring? So I know we all want to transfer that learning, right? That is our goal. I, I strongly believe that teachers do not come into this profession and say, you know what, I really want to mess some kids up. Yep, that's what I'm coming to do. I can't wait to do that. I can't wait to go in there and just, you know what I mean, put them up. No, you go in there because you care about those kids and you have planned to the best of your ability and you want them to do well. No doubt. But if we can find ways to get them to transfer that learning even better, we're all for it, right? I just got to learn them and see what they are. So awesome connection. Okay, any other thing before we move on? Want to value that? Okay, great. So let's do a little talk. I know you did a little reading before you came and you posted some of your answers, you know, on the um, actual Google Drive that we have and you did some thinking. So I'm just interested to hear is what do we think formative assessment is just based on some of the initial thoughts that we had and some of the initial readings that we had. What are we thinking this is, okay? Oh, you have some chips in your bucket, talking chips. So whatever they are, whether it's a little chip, a little glass chip, take those and everybody um, go ahead and, and get one. This particular structure does not need to go in any order. I know you have used it with me before, but I do want to just emphasize that when you're ready to make your comment, you throw it in. You don't have to you know, go in in order. You want to make sure that you have participated at one point during the uh, round. And then when your chip's not in, it, it also sends a reminder that I'm listening right now, right? The purpose of this is to, again, ensure that all voices are heard, all voices are valued. Some students are not prone to go ahead and throw their opinion in, but it doesn't mean they don't have anything to say. Other people love to tell everybody what they think. 
But then sometimes we don't get to hear from everyone. So this particular structure we're doing in here to model also something you can try in the class to ensure all voices are heard and it's a formative assessment, right? This is a way, if I'm listening and listening carefully, I am formatively assessing what we know. Okay? Just pointing that out. All right, so you're going to speak about what you think, define it. What's formative assessment? All right? Let those chips go around, throw them in in any order, and begin that conversation. Everybody has done the talking. We're probably just continuing that conversation after. So at, for an instructor, when you're using this strategy, you're really looking to see, and we all participated. I know you participated when you're what? Your chip is down. So I can kind of gauge, you know, it helps timing a bit in the class and pacing, which is always, you know, really, time is of the essence. So it does help with your pacing and timing. So if that's something you're trying to regulate, these structures are great for that as well. Um, also, let's step out of the experience, and I want to do a lot of stepping out. We want to highlight best practices and say why we're doing them. What did we just do just now? What was that? It was another formative assessment. So we haven't really been here that long, and we've already had multiple formative assessments. I want you to really shift your mind to how am I utilizing the information students give me? Write that down on that paper. How am I utilizing the information students give me in the moment? In the moment. I see a lot of exit tickets, but if we wait to use an exit ticket, what does that tell us? 
Yes. If you're not understanding what, what yeah. they know and stuff at so, the moment. Yeah. If, if I wait to assess the learning at the end of the lesson when you exit, when am I adjusting? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? I can adjust tomorrow. That's a great way to do it at the end of the lesson so I can make tomorrow better. But should there be other opportunities to do it? Should I have gauged your understanding before the end of the lesson? Right. We want to gauge it so we can instruct tomorrow in a more powerful way. But if I haven't built in any other times during the day, I am losing valuable time in a class to make a shift, to adjust on my feet, to think, what do they know, what don't they know, so I can make sure I get there. Let me also connect to what learning outcome in, are we talking about? right now. Where are we within that learning today? The first one. Uh -huh. Yeah, first one. We're defining it. I'm not there yet. I don't think we have gotten to the depth of it yet. Listening to conversations, I think we're hitting on the surface. So I'm going to wait a little while before I check it off, but I want you to know where you are in your learning right now as we're really trying to define it. Okay? Based on what I heard, and I heard a lot of great conversations as I went out, I heard somebody say, check for understanding. That's a pretty good one, right? This is a time for me to check for understanding, okay? So I heard that in the conversation come up, all right? I also heard a few comments about, I want to make sure that before they leave, I know whether or not they get it, which also is a point of clarification, right? We want to make sure before they leave that they get it, but also what? In enough time to adjust. adjust enough time to adjust. Let's kind of talk about this a bit. And I love this little cartoon. It's so cute. It says, uh, hey, I taught tri uh, Stripe how to whistle. I don't hear him whistling. Well, I said I taught him. I didn't say he understood it, right? I didn't say he learned it, which is kind of, you know what I mean, really resonates with us as teachers. We teach something, but how do we know they get it? How do we know that they're learning it? And do they struggle? And then what do I do, right? So let's think through a couple of major learnings here and uh, make sure we cement the ideas that we came in with. So take a little minute, look, look at the learning on the slide. Underline things that are important to you. What stands out here? Are there anything in there that clarifies the knowledge you came in with? Anything on that slide that kind of takes you to a different place? I want to know what is on this slide that did not come up in your conversation. That's what I want to know. You talk, you define formative assessment. What's on this slide that did not get said in your small group? Yes. Um, it cannot be separated from the instructional process. Okay, so that's something that might not have gotten you know, noticed. It cannot be separated from the process of instruction as I'm going through the daily learning from the beginning of the lesson to the middle to the end. I can't separate this. It's not a separate process. It's part of it. And if done well, it's going to probably alter how I move forward. If I come, up, if I come in my class with a plan and I never, ever, ever deviate from it every day, every single day, I might not be gauging students' understandings in a way that I'm utilizing it. At least at some point. You want to make good plans. You want to plan for those moments. You want to try to anticipate struggles and get them on the front end. But something is going to happen during that instruction, if you are listening and posing those moments, that will make you do something differently. Change it up just a bit. And those are the on-the-fly thinking moments that we do plan for. We plan for them. But we also have to adjust. Okay? What else? Informs both teacher and student. There we go. So yeah, it's informing me as an instructor. What about the student? How does a formative assessment inform a student? What is that doing for the student? Yeah, it's it's stop and see, think about what they know and what are they thinking about the topic. Right. 
if students receive feedback around what they know and don't know, are they aware of it? Can they do something different to get themselves toward that learning target? Yes. And just kind of piggybacking off of what you said, it's allowing a student to take more ownership and yeah. it's setting them up to be able to, when they finally graduate, that they can do that same self-assessment out in the real world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest pieces of research from John Hattie, and I know we've mentioned this before in some of the learnings, he did a meta-analysis of um, things that actually impact instruction, impact learning. So things that, when done, in the learning process impact how kids learn. And one of the biggest things you can do with students is actually have them own learning and self-reflect and set goals. Because what that, what that does for kids is now, I am thinking about where do I wanna go? How am I, I know how I'm going to get there. I have some steps along the way. I know the journey that I'm on, and I'm also able to gauge whether or not I got it. There is a way in my mind that I know I got this and I don't. And then I can make some adjustments. Great examples, when we're writing, and we use some criteria, like a rubric, and kids are able to self-assess, peer self-assess, stop and think where they are. If that time is there and we let them see these tools and dig into these tools, that tells me something as a student, and it also tells me where I need to go. Okay? That's a real concrete example that we can really dig into, right? That, okay, I see where I'm at with this, and I kind of know where I'm struggling. So that is a way that students are adjusting. You know, students can begin to adjust when they have that time. Okay, so yes, we're, we're going to add lots of ways to that, but I think that's definitely deep in here. As we move forward here, let's keep going, because I think those are two really good points there to define us. Um, we realize that formative assessment informs teaching. I heard that in what you were saying, and I saw that on your, um, you know, your anticipation guide. I realized that that is something you came into here and knowing, yes, this formative assessment informs my teaching, right? Um, it's, and improves learning in that classroom while it's in progress. Now that's the new piece. I, that's the piece I really want you to start out there because I think that's a point of clarity I really want to make as we progress today is while it's still in progress. Did see a couple people who are in different parts of their understanding with that. Had a few misconceptions with, we, it was at the end of the day, right? Like, I'm going to do a formative assessment at the end of the learning. I want to shift that mindset to, we can formatively assess all the rest of the lessons. We should have some beginning, some middle, and some end formative assessments built in so you still have time to adjust. So that right there, flag that out because we're going to see different ways we can do that. I've called out a few already. Um, we want to influence the outcome of the race while it still is happening, right? If the only thing we ever do is an autopsy, can't we really change anything? You know, the, the summative is the autopsy. All right, this is what they get, this is what they get, but I don't have time to fix it unless the next day when I move forward. So we want to try to influence outcomes while we still can get the best outcomes we can every day, not just on a, you know, a test or a quiz or a benchmark in a room such. Everyday learning, as much as we can influence it, we're going to be winning that race. A uh, few other things here. Go ahead and flag on this page anything that stands out that was not said so far. Is there a new point? Is there something here that stands out that takes it to the next level? Or is there something here that's truly challenging? Like, yes, for me, this is challenging, you know? Because I think there's a lot of things in here that I knew, but I don't I haven't been able to do them yet, right? Like, yeah, I know it, but it's hard. <laughs> How do you do that? This is hard for me. to the person next to you, 
pair off at this point, about what on this paper, what on this screen is hard. What's challenging that you have tried to do, but you have found it challenging when you tried to do it? Talk about that. I can be a big but to get there, I try, you know, you try to notice, be excited, get it, get it, get it. And some of you just stare at you. Just give me that, 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 that's what I do. I just wrote that down. It's like, I don't think I'm going to be around. I just wrote that down. Like, what am I Being a first year teacher at something is super difficult. Talk to me and feel free to say it. What is challenging on this screen? What's a challenge for you? Your challenge might not be somebody else's challenging, but what did you hear that's kind of challenging? You know? Yes. One thing and I were talking about how our like our situation, my, his classroom and then mine, we have so many different students coming in at different times or different levels that it is a lot of customized learning. Whereas we're setting a student up at this level with this kind of idea, and then this student is maybe a little bit higher, and we're getting them going, and then we have like a little mass of students that are on the same level, and right. it's like a breath. But exactly. we're setting up customized learning for each student, honestly. Right. 
because you've seen they're in different spots and that's what they need to progress. If this is where they're at, it's difficult, right, to do that. But you're saying, okay, this is where they're at. Now what's going to take them to the next step? Which is not the same as the person sitting next to them at some times. And so always thinking about the student, the learner, the class. An honors class should look different than a regular class. You should be thinking differently about how you present that information to them. But within those classes, there are still individual students who need different things. So then not just whole class differences, but then, well, what does this student need that this one doesn't? And when you teach kids who are coming in all day, that's a lot of thinking. <laughs> that's a lot of planning. There's a lot of times to think through that. It is difficult and challenging. Right. So hopefully today as we flesh through some of this, we can think about how to do that or what techniques or strategies can help us do it with some efficiency to have some good next steps. Anything else on here that kind of uh, would stand out as, yeah, that's, that's hard, that's challenging. Yeah. Um, in 10th grade, the, mo the engagement and motivation mm -hmm. is in just incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we do, when I do like, like the formative assessment and kind of go mm -hmm. around and you know, assess and talk to each student, mm -hmm. um, they actually use that as a reason, you know, why not to progress. Mm -hmm. So even though they may be self-aware and starting to, to see where they're at with their learning, then they, they kind of regress and they say, oh, well, we don't want to. Or So the, the motivation is definitely a challenge. Right. So we're going to talk about that because we want to keep kids engaged cognitively in our lessons, right? How do we keep them with them, with us? How do we purposefully plan our lessons so at every moment of time, their mind's working, their mind's thinking, their mind's talking, and I don't lose them, right? I can't lose them because if I lose them, then they're definitely not going to get to those targets. So those are the moments that the teacher tricks you need to be able to pull out that bag to say, okay, well, when this happens, how am I going to respond? When I get this type of action, is there something differently? Even if it's not on the plan. I anticipated struggle. I planned it. It helped. There was one I didn't anticipate. It happened. Now what? Do I keep going or do I stop and adjust now? Can I do something a bit different to get that engagement, right? And so we want to give you techniques that you're planning for, anticipating, you know, for the struggle that you put in so you don't get it. But for those moments when it happens, you also need to have some on the fly moves to say, okay, well, let's try this. They're looking dead. Their heads are down. I didn't plan for it. Yep, get the apple out. Guess what? I did that. I did that with this turn and talk. I adjusted. I didn't have that plan just now. But you were kind of looking at me. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give it to them. They need to talk. They need to talk more. They need to own it. And that's okay for me to go off my initial plan because I formatively assessed and saw you needed to speak. You needed to think. You need to own it. And I threw in the challenging thing. I didn't plan for that. That's okay because you got something out of it. Because I saw people going, hmm, you know, like, oh, God, what this? I'm like, yeah, great idea. Let's put it in. So it's okay to adjust when you need it. Yes. Um, I just wanted to let you know that that motivation <laughs> stuff also happens at the elementary exactly. level. <laughs> um, yes. And I think because that's been said, mm -hmm. one of the other things that I struggle with is I'll have a formative assessment, and I'll be doing that during, especially in math, mm -hmm. during the whole math lesson. And every day, and I'm like, oh, they're finally getting it. They're finally getting it. Then we take a math test. <laughs> and I'm like, what have I been doing the past three weeks? Uh, I guess I haven't been in here. Because <laughs> and then, like, the last math yeah. test, I had to stop and mm -hmm. just take all the papers up and reteach. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was well, when we got it back, I mean, and I, you know, when we, we started back over, the, the grades were actually really great, but. I felt like I had to do a lot of helping, a lot of reteaching, a lot of. Mm -hmm. So the the connection between the summative assessment and the formative assessments are. Yeah. So sometimes you're seeing it and it doesn't transfer. And yesterday, and we were doing spring board walkthroughs, and I sat next to a student in a math class, in a um, middle school setting, and um, I was watching her persevere through a problem, like really trying to look at how Springboard had it set up, the model, and she was following that model step by step, like you could see she would go back, she would do something, then she would go back and read it, and then she would do something. And eventually she got to that right answer, and then I <coughs> to her, I said, um, you know, how have you been doing on the assessments you've been doing? She said, well, you know, sometimes I do really well and sometimes I don't. I said, well, well why do you think that is? She says, well, 
they don't put the example on the test. You know, and that's true. She's like, I can do it when I have a sample there, but I can't do it when you complete the sample. That was insightful for me. So my question to myself is, I wonder if she ever has chance to practice without that sample there. You see, without the scaffold. I wonder if that scaffold was ever removed in an opportunity and instruction to do it, so that way she could transfer what she learned to a situation that would look like the sum did. So keep that in your mind as you think through, I notice they're getting it in class. I'm providing scaffolds, right, for learning. Do I ever wean the scaffold? Do I ever remove the scaffold? See if they can do it before the test. Keep that in your mind. Write that down on that paper. Do I remove the scaffold and have a formative assessment to see if they'll get it before the test? That's a wonderful question to ask yourself if you have a lot of kids who are not giving you the result you want on that summative. Have I given them a chance to practice without the scaffolds, without the models, without the things that I have provided? If they can't take it in the test, if they can't bring it in the test, then they need an opportunity to practice it without that tool. If it's allowed in the test, then it should be on the table, right? <laughs> not to say you should not provide scaffolds because you need them, because if not, they'll never get it. But at what point do we release? <clears throat> Keep that in your mind. All right, I think we did a great job delving in here. Let's deepen our learning even more. After we read this article, I'm gonna feel really good about checking off um, defining formative assessment, okay? I really feel good about it. I feel we really cement this learning. So what's the, how this is going to go down is you're going to take time and read on your own and you're going to annotate in this way. You're going to star things that you notice that are important to you. You think it's important, but to start by it. If you like it, you particularly, you know, I really like that. Heart it. Put a heart by it. If you have a question, you're not quite sure what that means or you just, you know, I need to know more about that, question mark. And... Hey, exclamation, this surprises me. I did not realize that. It's surprising. Okay, take time, read the article, use your little annotation um, key up here, and then we will move on after that.
we pull our own happiness wagon wagon in here, so just feel free. If you need a break, take a break. Go to the bathroom, get a coffee, and just come back when you need. Wrap it up in the next minute. Thank you. Looks like most of us are finished. We're just going back over some of the notes we wrote and some of the things. Before we move into the discussion piece of this, I like to do what I like to call my step out. Okay? My step out is I want to take you into my world around why we do what we do. Okay? The value of this learning in this setting and how it transfers to your classroom. One. Um, I want you to notice some things that may go unnoticed if I don't point them out. These are my chunks of my lesson. These are the things I want you to walk away with today. I want you to be very conscious, because I'm building consciously competent teachers, about when I'm formatively assessing in this class today. I have certain things I want you to walk away with. 
So I'm planning what? Moments in time for me to see where you are and for you to know where you are with each one of these major learning. Okay? So there were times. Tell me how did how am I assessing? How have I assessed today formative you defining formative analysis? Not uh, assessment. What are some ways we have done that so far? First piece of paper, right? Agree or disagree, right? Just straight off the bat, that helped. That was one way. What's another way we gauge for understanding of defining formative assessment? Yes. A round robin discussion. Right. Round robin and discussion. Not the mere act of round robin discussion. The activity alone does not promote <coughs> you knowing whether or not you know. What promotes whether or not I know whether or not you got that? How? What's the difference maker? You are circulating. Yes, and what do I do when I circulate? Listen. Yeah, and I'm listening for keywords, key definitions. I'm also listening for confusion, confusion, saying of something that might lead somebody into a different thing. So the key to that is not the activity itself, but what the role of the teacher instructor is during that activity. Okay, so simply planning for them is not enough. We have to be doing something ourselves. And then, not only, now what do I do with this information? I have it, I've gathered it, do I keep it in my pocket or do I do something differently? Or am I right where I want to be? Okay, thinking through. Each segment, right? So that's two times right there. What do you think is another way? I'm gauging, understanding, because there was a few more, there was a lot more that I'm playing for, that's two. It's another way I'm trying to see where you are in your thoughts. What do you think I'm paying attention to? You said it before to me. What was I paying attention to? Mm -hmm. How in this activity right now do you think that we had a formative assessment? Mm -hmm. Right. And here's where I want to bring you to the next step. I know where you are in your thoughts, but who else knows where they are? You do. If you have a question mark by something, what does that tell you? Not I'm not understanding something. And what's the value of knowing you don't know something? Yeah, I need to figure this out before I leave today, right? Like, I don't know what this means. I have a confusion. I need to clarify this learning for myself before I leave out of here to know that I've met these targets. I could have said, okay, read the article, go ahead and underline stuff, box stuff. But what does that tell me and tell you? What you know. no. Can I know what you're thinking? Do I know where you're confused? Do I know where you're understanding? Do I know what surprises you? No. So the point of the annotation at this point is for you to think, for you to be aware of where you are in your learning, and for me to be aware. So we both can act on it. You can act on it and I can act on it. Because when you're invested in where you are in the learning process, you can make a change and I can make a change. So. The value of this kind of piece while we're reading is for us all to know where we are and to do something about it, okay? So I really want you to think about that when you're planning your upcoming lessons, the why behind something, and not just applying it and putting it in, but putting it in to promote learning, right? I could have done this if I did not circulate and did not look, and you did not, if you didn't do what I asked you to do, you didn't help yourself either. If you were just underlining stuff and you never start anything and you never put a question mark and you never put an exclamation, does that help you? No. So actually, you applying it, I'm applying it, we're thinking about it, that's what's promoting us. Okay? So that's a real important distinction that I want to point out right here for this to be applied effectively. Okay? So when you're thinking through all these little tidbits, I want you to think about that when you plan today. Because the students have to be doing something, but I need to be doing something. And then the information, in order for it to be powerful and promote learning, it all has to come together. Okay? Now what we want to do, with what we've learned, is we want to have a chance to really talk about this learning. So, we're going to discuss those annotations. Okay? We, um, I'm sorry. We are going to discuss something that resonated with us, whether it be important 
whether it's I like it, whether it's a question. I want you to have a roundtable discussion about that. I think the best method to do this probably would be talking chips at this point to allow us to have more of a free flow and not in a certain order. This time, take two. Take two, you have two opportunities to throw it in because this is a deeper conversation. There's a lot more learning that has taken place, so that's why I want to choose two. All right? Feel free to throw that chip in and talk about one of those four things. But I never showed them what it should look like, or I like to have a model of it. Then I get frustrated because I don't see it. But I didn't show them what I wanted to see. No one in this like, I need to really take a step back and look at myself. If no one got it. So I'm I'm very much feeling like I'm very much 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 like I'm very you know, whatever that is, instead of doing these one assessments in the middle of the lesson or in the middle of the Watch out. But then it's again, she has show it, taking the time to use the exemplars in that
to check for understanding, uh, checking just to make sure that they're doing, doing it. They're doing it wrong. I don't have point where I can't even worry about that right now because I have 10 other ones. So honestly, make sure you know, I'm circulating to keep them on task instead of circulating for understanding. Uh, 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
now in this room makes me very happy. I just want to say that. The things you're saying, the things you're thinking, I see that learning progressing. And as far as continuum of learning, where we started and where we're at now, we're much deeper in what we're saying. I want to share out a few things before we move forward because I, I was listening with intent and I did ask, I pinpointed a few people that said something that was really profound that I wanted to be sh shared with the larger group, okay? So first of all, I think I, we hit on something here. Do you remember what we were talking about? And I said it was rigor, a conversation about rigor and those pieces. And can someone capture that little moment in time? Well, initially we were all talking about this one piece about how mm -hmm. um, um, it says the assessments will produce no formative benefits if teachers administer them, report the results, and then continue with this extract with instruction as previously planned, as can easily happen when teachers are expected to cover a hefty amount of content in a given time. Mm -hmm. And like some of us had like all four of these listed in that yes, one. Like right there, right there. <laughs> because we were expected to just go, go, go. But it also kind of made me reflect when you came in and started talking about rigor. And I think that's kind of harder when it comes to the ELA stuff. But like with math, it made me think, okay, well maybe I wouldn't feel so like I have to keep going if I implemented more rigorous um, structure and activities and formative assessments and stuff before the test. It's harder with ELA because these kids are coming in in my fourth grade class at first, second, third grade reading levels and they're not really understanding so it's to me it's like going back starting from scratch mm -hmm. but with math I think that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just kind of capture that too is what we were saying is we have an actual summative assessment where we're putting a grade on it to gauge whether or not kids got it. A great opportunity to make sure that they're going to be more successful is to make sure we have that matched rigor in our instruction. That there was an opportunity to think like that with the scaffolds removed that they are not allowed to use on the assessment, but to the rigor, to the same level, not watered down in any way. So there's an opportunity to think at that high level in class and get feedback reflective of myself as a learner on how I can improve, as well as get feedback from the teacher and my peers on how I can improve. That was very, very important in moment in time. And we set something at this table right here that says, well, what can I do as teacher to ensure? Talk to me about what you were saying there, because this was really, really powerful. What, did, what is another way? I was saying that oftentimes I would get frustrated when I realized my students didn't produce the level of work that I wanted to. And then I had to take the moment to reflect and say, what did I provide them with an exemplar example? And more often times than not, I did not. And then I get frustrated time and time again, and they don't know what an exemplar model looks like so so what's the change what's the shift the shift is i need to provide students with uh -huh. the level of work that i want to see them with so that they know what to work towards yeah. and to capture that statement let's let's end up here because i think what we said i want you to talk about the socratic seminar and why you guys did what you did because i think that's another great example yeah so me and another teacher at our school, English teacher, 
we put our students together and we did one big Socratic seminar. So I teach honors, she teaches on level, and we are combining and pairing off students. So at the beginning of it, you had some of the unlevel students who weren't really citing the evidence properly, and they were just like saying their point. And by the end of it, after seeing some of my students do it, they ended up modeling and mirroring what they saw the honors kids doing, and we want to do it again because we yes. got so do, are you the only one who could provide a model for what it looks and sounds like? Mm -hmm. What a powerful way to use those kids to model for each other what exemplary looks like. And the last comment I want to make is, can this happen in a PE class? You tell us, can it happen in a PE class? Why? Tell us a way. Um, with the girls that I have, I have quite a few that are on travel teams and you know, play ball a lot. Well, I get them to lead a group of girls to help them understand because you have some that don't know how to hold the ball and you have others that are very, very good. Not you know, so it's really <laughs> hard. Yeah. It's hard to, you know, be on the same level with all, you know, the all uh, girls that are good get bored. So I get them to lead it and, and they get good with it. So, so if we have those kids who play on travel teams, sitting next to the person who never picked up a ball, use that strength right there. You know, I'm not going to put all the kids in the travel team in one little group and just let them, uh, you know, hoard their excellence right there and then everybody else struggle. No, I'm going to disperse them out and say, you know what? Pay attention. You know, hoard excellence. Don't hoard the excellence. Spread it out. We, you know, make sure that. That child is modeling how to throw the ball, how to position the body, how to make it do what it is. Because all day long, you know, you're trying to do all the work. No, spread it out and let those kids help you. Find excellence, but you have to know where it is, right? We have to pay attention to who is doing this right and can I disperse them? Can I utilize them in my classroom in a powerful way to make sure they're talking to some of the people who need to be pushed? If you are an excellent writer, then I'm going to might pair you somebody who, you know, they might be on that cusp. And they, you, just a little feedback from you can push you to the next level. Okay, you're getting this problem solving right here. You're able to explain it. Well, here's somebody who's getting the steps. They just can't put it into words. Maybe they need to be sitting together to push each other. So use the strength of your kids to give peer-to-peer -peer feedback and to model excellence. You as teacher model excellence. Use exemplars. Use those examples as well as provide opportunities for kids to do that, whether it be through the discourse whether it be through modeling what um, their thinking looks like. If kids are going to be models of excellence, what, what, what must we consciously do when we plan instruction? That's my question. If, ki if we're going to utilize kids as models, yes? We have to know what students are capable of being teachers for others, yeah. so what their level is. Yeah. So, we, so have we have to have a good gauge of what students know and don't know. What else must we do when we plan in order to utilize that and capitalize on that? What else must we do when we plan? Well, I think just to get to the point that Alara is bringing up, we have to embed those formative assessments to be able to gauge which students can teach others. Right. What kind of brain is a learning brain? A talking and thinking brain. Now I'm going to ask that question again. What must we do when we purposefully, what must we purposefully embed in our instruction in order to utilize the strength of our students? Talking and what? Thinking. Are we purposefully embedding in the appropriate chunks opportunities to talk, opportunities to think where kids can be models for each other. See how that's pushing it a little step up. So now I'm talking about how am I benefiting from formative assessment. I feel really good right now based on our conversation to tell you I think we have captured number one. Give me a thumbs up if you feel very good about defining formative assessment for others. Who feels good about like, you know, I can pretty much tell you what that is. Yeah? Yeah? I thought so too, but I wanted to gauge you. I think we're good with this. I think we begin to really spout out those benefits, but right now I'm going to hold off. Let's do this next piece before we check that off. And we're starting to even talk about how we're going to embed them in instruction, which was awesome because you took that activity to another place, starting to say, well, in my classroom I did this, so I could do that which I think we're working right now on two and three, okay? 
Go ahead and look at those learning objectives on your front of your page and check off where you think you are. Where are you right now in your learning? What ones you feel really confident with? Check off the ones you feel confident with and just kind of leave the ones who we didn't get quite to. Maybe you are beyond where we are because you, you know, hey, I got that. If you feel confident, check it off. Objective. I like that. A lot of people feeling really good about those benefits too. So I, I think that um, that tells me we really we are owning it. Yeah, just this is just for you. I'm just interested in where you think you are in your learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, step out again. Do you ever do that in class? Have you ever given a chance? for kids to stop and think, well, what do I get? What do I know? What don't I know? Where am I and what the learning target is for today? Do I get it? Is there a point that I still need to learn? Oh, wait. I'm not quite sure about this part of the objective. I, I have this. We're just not there yet. Have you ever done that before? Mm -hmm. What's the value of that? What's the value of giving a student an opportunity to think about where they are in their learning process? Turn and talk to the person next to you. What's the value of that? assessment not just for me it's also for you right so we're we're both working on that same goal of getting you to learn these things we're staying tight to our con you know what we're trying to do today and we're knowing what we need to do and moves we need to make to get us there and keep us focused so that's just keep it that in mind okay so go ahead and flip to the next slide <coughs> talk a little bit about this here not to stay long because I think we kind of get this but I want to point out a couple of things that might help clarify the depth of one of the misconceptions from the anticipation guide. Um, formative assessment, yes, we have those objectives, yes, we have goals, yes, we have standards. We do a pretty good job identifying them. We know what they are, we study them, we do backwards design. Then we say, okay, yeah, let me unpack all of that, let me annotate and plan for my what? My lessons, my instructions, I'm planning. While I'm doing all that, now I'm going to go ahead and give that instruction. And while I'm giving instruction, I'm doing what we're saying right now. I'm gathering what? Data. I am gathering information about whether or not kids get these things, whether or not they got the objective. They're getting the goals. They're accomplishing the depth of the standards. Now, when I'm gathering that data, I'm also analyzing it. Now, here's the point. Here's the point I want to make about these three that is a point of confusion sometimes. Then I respond to it. If I'm using it formatively, does it have to happen at the end of a lesson? Or when I give a test? Mm -hmm. Sometimes this cycle, right, happens many times in a lesson. How many times did we bounce back to that learning targets today? How many times have we gathered data and process what we know, what we don't know, and I'm looking at what you know and don't know, and then I'm responding to it. 
At every point in this lesson, we're doing this little cycle over and over again. So it's not just a one-time thing that happens in a lesson. It's happening many times, that cycle, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind because I think that aha, that major takeaway will help me plan better lessons. If I realize that I am cycling and trying to see what kids know and don't know and allow them to see what they know and don't know and we're all responding to it, the learning will increase. Okay, so that's the depth of the conversation that takes us to the next level from where we started with our knowledge to where we're going to lead. I think that's profound because what that will lead to is doing something different when I plan and when I'm in the moment and when I instruct. With that in mind, what I want you to do right now is take a sticky note. Based on what we've talked about, what is the biggest aha you've had yet today? What is the one biggest aha you've had so far that changes the way you thought when you walked in here to now? The biggest aha. summarize for you right now. We're going to do a quick summary. Based on what I've read, and I've read everybody's response, the two ideas resonate as the top two. One, students need to be involved in formative assessment. That was a big key for a lot of you. Like, I think that was a shift in where we came in to now. The second top, the highest, which might have been even higher than that one was, it's not just at the end of the lesson. I need to, I need to start doing this while I'm teaching more and use the information. That's basically, in a nutshell, what I heard. One, we need to involve students more. I need to use my students more. It was, uh, I need to involve the ones who know a little more to be exemplars kind of thing. And the second top one was that other one. Hey, you know what? I need to plan for this to happen not just at an end, but all throughout the lesson so that way I know where kids are and can push them to the next level. And I need to do something about it. Some people say, I'm gathering information, but I'm not doing anything with it. Okay, so that's some big aha moments. That's a, that's a big shift from where you were when you came to now. Now I want you to start thinking. This is the point of lesson where you start thinking, what am I going to do about it? Right? Now I know this. No, knowledge is power. Now what am I going to do with the, the knowledge that I have? You have the benefits. I feel really good about the benefits, and I think I want to go ahead and shift. Based on what you said you learned just now, I know you're realizing. Now... We're getting deep. How are we going to do this? How are we going to use this in our instruction? 
how are we going to use this formative assessment to change what we're doing every day? Application. All right. Let's pinpoint a couple of things, cement them out, and move deeper. All right. We really have to think about those kids, right? We have to think about those learning styles, and we have to think about adapting that instruction. You said that right there in your aha moment. <clears throat> Tracking individual student achievement. I want to say something here is that's student focus, but are you the only one who can track student achievement? No. Oh, kids can own learning. In the classes with the most growth, I have seen procedures in place for kids to own their learning. Kids who say, oh, this is how many ARP points I have. This is the goal I have set for myself for the, you know, the end of this week. And look, I'm at it, and I'm, I'm bubbling in where I am. I'm feeling very proud of that. Well, if I didn't set a goal, it might not, you know, I might hit it, I might not. I don't really know how many books or how many points I need to get, nor do I really care because I didn't really think about it. But now I know, and I'm doing something about it, and I'm tracking it, and more likely I'm going to go ahead and act on it. They're tracking Lexia. They're tracking Zern. In those places where they do it, kids track it. Kids say, I want to gain blank points because that's how I'm being pushed. And then I'm going to consciously make that effort and I'm going to track it to see if I got there. In middle and high school classes, I'm seeing some kids setting uh, goals on assessment to assessment. Last time I took an assessment, I was at a basic. You know, this time I really want to push to be at a mastery. So this is what I want to try to do to get myself there. Or on benchmark. When I took the LEAP test last time, I was at a mastery. My goal for myself on a LEAP test is to be at advanced, because that's a push for me. Well, guess what? If I'm going to be at advanced on a LEAP test and every other thing I do, I have to be working at that level. So I'm setting some quarterly goals for myself to make sure I'm doing it. I'm checking myself. Goal setting, beautiful thing. Kids owning it. If they track it and they care, it's more likely going to happen. Okay? So think about that. How are you investing kids in their own learning? How are you helping kids to self-reflect what they have, what they don't? But also, are they tracking where they are? Do they know where they are? Are they setting a goal for where they want to go? Do they know? And is there a way you can do that with what you teach? Okay. It's a moment of time for you to think. Designing student assessments, even the mini ones. I'm not talking about all that, you know, end of the, the unit kind of things, because a lot of our curriculum writers do that. You know, they do those moments for us to make them come on. But is there something you can design those in the moment assessments? Are we even utilizing what's there and the value of what's in the curriculum, like our springboard and our wit and wisdom and our CKLA and our Eureka and all, all of the tools that we have? Are we reading the teacher rap and the teacher notes? Are we using the teacher notes? It tells us how we can bring this up for kids who get it, how we can say something in moments that we can formally assess, but are we working through problems like a kid and thinking about what kids need to think and what they're going to struggle with? And then are we utilizing the notes to see how we can push the thinking? How beneficial is it is if you think through a problem like a student and actually go through the problem solving method or the writing process or whatever it is that you're doing. Actually go try to throw the ball. Go try to kick the ball like that. Try to play that musical piece in that way. Whatever it is you're teaching, do it like the kid would have to do it. And then you're going to see where is this going to be difficult? At what point will they struggle? And not just the group. At what point will my EL student struggle? At what point will the special education student that I have sitting in my class struggle? And is there something I need to do differently if that struggle? If I anticipate that struggle ahead of time, should I not try to um, set that student up for success by providing something? Is it okay to provide something a little bit differently instructionally for one than the other? If you need conversation stems and you need sentence starters, is that okay? Yeah. Should I release them at some time? Yeah. But let me provide them, teach you, and then start to release. Does that make sense? Okay. And students have to have that opportunity to grow. But if they never get feedback from us or each other or even through self-reflection or holding up something against criteria, 
they don't really know where they stand in their own learning process day to day, minute to minute. It's got to be a way for us to gauge whether or not we're getting it, but then grow. The growth part is the hard part, right? Like now, if I know where I'm at, what do I do to fix it? What do I do to get a moment of clarity or to know how to get to that next step? So op those opportunities go there. So student focus, real, real big. I see a lot of writing on this page. Because we're going to apply this in just a minute. And structurally informative, I think we really are walking away with this strong. I think we know we, this is informing us. Those formative assessments are aligning the ways. They're also letting us know what strategies we need to pull out. At the back of those books that we use, we use all this tier one curriculum. There are tons of strategies. It was so enlightening yesterday when I did a walkthrough. Guess what a kid did? Went to the back of the book and pulled the strategy out and actually used it. I was so impressed because not only did the teacher know the strategy, the kid did. The kid went to the back, pulled the strategy, applied it, used it, and helped themselves get out of the mess they were in. So they knew there was a strategy in place to help me, knew where to get it, applied it, and then helped themselves. That was great to see. So if kids know when to take a strategy out and use it, you have arrived, right? That's what you want. So, beautiful stuff. And so all of this is guiding our decisions as we move forward. Last real point here is look at these, these, um, these bullets. Start something that resonates with you. See, see on there what's speaking out to you. We're going to do some call-outs here. What's something that resonated with you from this page? Something that stands out. Yes? Uh, the fact that they should be transparent to students, because sometimes the language isn't necessarily transparent to students, and we have to give them a better explanation of what these objectives are actually asking them to do or right. reach. You know, that's what we can student from the language. They have to be transparent. You know, we don't want to hide the objective. We need them to know right away, this is what you're going to learn today, you know? The way we even worded it today, who's learning? I. I am learning. You are learning. You owning your learning, and they have to know what that means. Um, it, it, in another district, at one point, they would always put the learner will, but then do the TWL. And start, the teacher would always start off with TWL, like, you know, the learner will. And then at one point, I kneeled down because I'd like to know what kids were thinking. I'm like, um, what's happening right now? What are you guys doing? He says, we're doing the learning wheel. I'm like, oh, the learning wheel. Yeah, the teacher says, the learning wheel. The learning wheel. Every time we start a lesson, she says, the learning wheel. I said, oh, well, what does that mean? I don't know. You have to have a learning wheel at the beginning of every lesson. That's what you do. You do a learning wheel. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, who's the learning? I don't know. It's a wheel somewhere. I don't know where it is. It's a learning wheel, right? That kid had no idea that that was for them. They just, he just knew at the beginning of every lesson we did the learning wheel. T, the, learn. That's what he heard. He didn't know that's what he was supposed to learn. He just knew the learning wheel started first. That's what we do. And I'm like, so what's the purpose of that? I don't know. I don't know what that purpose is. Who is that? And I said, who's it for? It's for the learning wheel. We had to like, get it, lady. And I'm like, oh, the learning wheel. Okay, so the learning wheel was somewhere. He didn't know where it was, but every day we did, the learning wheel was going to do that. I don't know what it was. It was, the, it was the best moment in time because it let me know. Sometimes we do things and, and we think, you know, we're there and we're getting it, but there he was doing the learning wheel, not knowing why he was doing the learning wheel, who the learning wheel was for. He was looking for the learning wheel. That learning wheel is pretty smart, right? <laughs> that is for you. You, that's, this belongs to you guys. Kids, this is not. And here's another misconception. We put those objectives on the board for those administrators. Because when they walk in, they want to see it. So that's not there for us. That's there for them. Because, you know, they're checking that off on my list. So just make sure I have that up. Because that's for the administrator. Is it for the administrator? Yes, it is on the checklist. But if we're not using that for kids, we're losing it. If it's getting in the PowerPoint and going away, it's not for kids. 
Who's it for? Are we actually using them? So let kids know these are for them, and they should be checking if they get it or not, and not the learning wheel, please. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, so we're using it, and it's providing us the information we need. So again, this is not just a moment of time just to assess. It actually focuses on achieving goals rather than determining whether or not it was met. <coughs> If every form of assessment, we're just trying to see, what well, was the goal met? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. I am doing this so we can achieve the goal. That's where the action comes in. The act of formative assessment, it is only formative if I'm doing something with the data I collect. Okay? So remember that. Because I think that's the shift we need to see in instruction based on walkthroughs. I'm going to be honest. I've done a lot of walkthroughs. And I think we're doing a lot of formative assessment. We're just not using them. We're just not using them to do anything different. Okay? So we need to know the what, but we also need to know the why, the how, and the when. Okay? And today we talked about chunking and knowing what we know at what point in time in enough time to make a difference. Let me give you a little bit of research. Based on, this is, a, this is probably the most cited source around formative assessment is this Black and William um, study inside the black box. And it was a study, uh, you know, really huge study of thousands and thousands of um, classrooms. And it shows an effect size of formative assessment between a 0.4 and 0.7. So, you know, put it in layman's terms, like the equivalent of going from 50 to 65 percentile. So there was a, a big growth as far as if we do formative assessment in this way it's defined, then it is growing kids. It's getting kids to move up levels. Okay? And it was a huge piece there in that study. Also, why do we involve kids? That's the other piece, you know. Why do we even want to put kids in that? Is because it will boost their student achievement, but not only that, if you're the talking brain, and you're the writing brain, and you're the thinking brain, you're going to be, who's involved here? Me, you. you. If the teacher's up there doing all the work, they're exhausted at the end of the day, and they're learning a lot. They are so smart. By the end of the day, they know this to, to this extreme depth. But if the kids are not leaving more exhausted than you, you need to give them some work. You need to give them some thinking, some talking, some writing, some analyzation, because that will increase their motivation. motivation. If you're having behavior problems in your class, put more student interaction in, put more talk in, put more think time in, put more formative assessment in, and let them, if they, if you're struggling there, that is a good way to get them involved. And it will decrease the amount of time that you have to stop because they're involved. They really are not going to want to misbehave. If they're authentically involved, they will start to, you know, lessen the amount of times you have to stop, correct, get them back. Because they're doing what they want to do, talk, think. Right, engage themselves. Um, not just take notes, watch the teacher solve the problem and write it down. Right? So, you know, there's a lot of stuff here about what happened in a student engagement survey, and you can guess how that came out. You know, this was 80,000 students from 19 schools, but less than 50% of those um, <coughs> students um, discussed grades and assignments with the teacher. So they have, and they just didn't discuss it. Um, Almost half in that 80,000 study from high school <coughs> said they did not receive prompt feedback. Uh, only 57% said that at any point in time did they contribute to a class discussion. So small things that we can do like the turn and talks, like the pears, like the talking chips, like the apples, we'll put it on them to do. What percentage do we have that actually talk today? 100. Did I hope you will talk? What if I just would call on you one by one? Do you think we would have 100% of people volunteering? No. You have to provide that structure that you take it off of the student. You, there's no opt-out, right? There's no opt-out. You're going to participate, and this structure is going to make sure of it. And many times, not just once. 
So there was so many times to talk, to engage, to discuss, to write. You can't help but to learn. You see that you're not you're not given a choice to learn. You're you're doing it right because of all that structure that's been put in ahead of time. So we want to bridge this gap here of our kids saying they're not talking. And we can blame them and say, well, you didn't participate. You need to care more. You need to try more. But we can also start to reflect, well, what can I do to encourage that a little bit more? Right? What can I purposefully put in my lesson to ensure the thinking and the talking and the learnings happen? And that's the point where I want you to really reflect on that. Okay? We want to see less of, I ask a really great question, and one or two students respond. Because one or two students thought, and one or two students contributed, but everybody else's brain wasn't going. Mm -hmm. So as many times as you can get them to think, write, share, share, you are in what? Encouraging that thought process there. Okay? And again, um, only half made choices about what they want to study. Um, so, put it in a nutshell, Providing frequent feedback and choices through formative assessment can help students see progress and feel supported, often changing their motivation. And it was encouraging to see yesterday <coughs> in some of the walkthroughs. I'd like to let you know. Some kids had the Chrome, you know, they had the Chromebook open and they were working in digital. Some kids wanted to write it on a paper. Other kids had a sticky note. That teacher had a lot of choice for that kids on how they were going to participate. They didn't say, you must do it this only one way. They gave a lot of flexibility about that as long as they could see the learn. And that was a great way for that kid. The kids said, well, you know, I work better on the computer. I, I, I'm excited when I can. You know, I, I work better when I can, you know, put it on a sticky note. Or I like to work from this book. And that was okay because the formative assessment still happened. And that kid had choice on how they were going to display. So it was wonderful. This is now where we're going to start to look at instruction, promoting student learning, and then bringing it into our lesson. Take a few moments and examine this paper. Read it to yourself because these are seven things. If you take nothing else away from you today, zero other things, this is to me the most important page in the whole entire packet. Because this tells you what you need to do. Right on here. This is what I need to do. This is what I need to embed in my instruction. If you do these things, you're going to get better results. These are your actions. Walk away with these seven things and try some of them. I want you to own these. Read them. Think about them. Think about which ones of these are you doing. Put a check by ones you do or have tried. Put a little triangle next to the ones that you don't use so often or that you know you need to do more of. You think you need to do more of it? Put that little triangle. It's not a negative. It's just... I'm not there yet. I didn't do that. Want to know how you can get more student growth? These are the seven things. That the strongest seven things you can do related to formative assessment. From <coughs> research. Take a sticky note and flag that page so you easily find it. Let it stick out really big. Because when you leave and you go to do stuff, and when you do this last activity for the day, I want you going back to this page. Because if you haven't thought about this when you're adjusting your instruction, I want you to embed these things, <laughs> at least some of them, to try the ones you haven't tried. So what's something on here that you do already? Let's celebrate. What's something on here you feel good about that you do? What's something you've tried or have done and you think you do it pretty good? Provide descriptive feedback. Okay, there you go, Wendell. So, in what way have you done that or, you know, have tried that? Well, in my class currently, we're using a 3D modeling program. Okay. And so, when the, the students are having trouble or I see that they're way off base on trying to make this object, yeah. 
I actually have to, you know, I give them the script feedback not only on what it is that they actually <coughs> did wrong, where they went wrong, mm -hmm. and then how they can fix it. Awesome. So right there as a real life application of doing something here that's said to be powerful for kids. This makes a difference on whether or not they get it. They're going to probably make stronger models with that feedback. Had you not taken that opportunity to stop right there and help the student adjust, that model probably won't be as strong as it would be had you taken that opportunity to do so. So that is promoting learning. That is you are promoting it by doing that particular formative assessment and then giving that feedback, right? Noticing was the first step. Doing something about it was what promoted it. Okay? Awesome. What is something else you do well on here? Anybody else want to share? Yes. I'm using exemplars of strong and weak work. Mm -hmm. Tell me a time you've done that. What kind of exemplar have you done? I teach DLA, so just this week we did the uh, embedded assessment. And before they started their actual writing, I gave them like a strong piece and the rubric, and they took time individually to look at the work, see how it matched up to the rubric, so they would know what to use in their own paper. Mm -hmm. they write. So providing a strong example of what a writing looks like <coughs> in the highest quality, lay on side of a rubric, but then have them use the rubric to notice why. Why is this strong? Not just put it up, yep, that's an example, do that, but noticing the critical points in the criteria to say, Oh, when it said use evidence, this is what you mean, right? When it says that commentary, that's what it looks like, you know? Being very explicit about that and pointing out the little minus, minuscule things that are not happening that is in this one. And that's, that's huge right there, okay? Um, what is something else, one more, something that we feel really good about or that we have done from this? Anybody else want to share one? Um, the learning targets um, on, on a daily basis, so the learning targets on the book um, are not kid friendly. Mm -hmm. So I actually, um, like we as a class kind of translate that into right. kid language, yeah, like, you know, is. like what, is, what does that mean? Um, and then I actually erase it for each period so that each period has to walk through that. So if an administrator looks at mine, they're going to be like, what is that? Oh, you changed. That's okay. But, um, yeah, so that way when we go back, I'm like, wait, you guys said that's what we're learning today. So where are we going yeah. with that? So in your class, they belong to the student, right? right? Those are for them. By them actually going through the act of reading them, trying to make sense of them, and putting them in their own words, that tells them this is for me. I have to put in my words because I need to do this. It sets them up with no, you know, knowing what the goal is. If I'm on a race and I never know where the finish line is, I'm not quite sure. I might even stop running because I don't understand where I'm going. But now, in, my, in your class, I know where I need to go. And I know how far I am to get there. So that's awesome, right? And that's some of like what we talk. Don't let them get caught in the learning wheel, right? <laughs> this is for you. This is where you need to go. go. I'll never forget the learning wheel. So what is something on here now to turn the, the, the page that you want to try or maybe you haven't done to the depth that you think you could that would really increase learning? Anybody want to take that risk, go out there and just be brief? Yes. Um, looking at number four, like I teach my students to self-assess and they set goals, but I'm not good about staying on them to constantly go back to their goals that they set. Mm -hmm. So you're setting goals, which is the first part of the process, right? But then revisiting them, really saying, well, how far am I? I have a goal. I know I want to lose 10 pounds, but I haven't, I haven't gotten back on the scale, so I don't know how far I am from it. I don't know if I've done it. I don't know if I've lost one pound, two pounds, or if I gained it. So I've done it. I've set the goal, but I didn't weigh in myself, right? So I have to weigh in. I have to say, well, where am I? Oh, wow, look, I lost five pounds. Now, you know, five more, I'm there. That's going to motivate me to keep going, right? Or... Oh God, I gained, I gained 30 pounds, I'm way off, and I'm going in the wrong direction, I need to get right. So that is just a really visible way to say we need to check in on this, right? We have to track progress, right? Setting goals is the first thing, tracking progress is the next, which translates to PLCs, so love that. Um, what else on here do we want to do a little bit stronger or we want to embed more of? Yes. Um, for me, number seven, engaging students and their self-reflection and keeping track of their learning. So I do class-wide goals for like our assessments. Mm -hmm. so I feel like I put up our data from the first period, and then I let my students decide what goal they wanted to hit for our next assessment. 
but I want to like focus them more individually. That way, like they're not like, oh well, the rest of the class can pull it up. I don't need to do it. Right. So we're doing a good job of getting that hole, but it's like me. What do I need to do? What's my part in that group? Right. And not just in larger things, but every day. You know, keeping track of our learning target tells me how far I'm away from those daily goals as well as the larger ones. So. That's just great ways to, you know, we say, how can we close the gap? But that's the question of the century, right? How can I close the gap? Well, pay attention. How can we close that gap? Those are real, you know, knowing where kids are is the first step, but then closing it is the hard part, right? Like saying, okay, now what? Well, those are really strong ways to close the gap. Like, actually, when kids show you they struggle on something, focus on that struggle. That's a real important way because if we teach and we never focus on the struggle then we're not going to fix it so I need to now say this is a struggle I noticed it how do I fix it and that by focusing on that part where the struggle is and designing learning around that struggle will increase it it will improve work so but we have to notice it and then think of a strategy or way to focus in so another way was teaching students focused revision Revision of anything. Revision of how they solve the math problem. Revision of that, uh, that writing. Revision of how they're batting. So now that you have watched Casey, who knows how to bat and hold their arms and all, now I want you to go back and fix yourself. Now let me see how you're going to hold the bat. Now let me see where you're going to put your feet. What, what part do you think you were doing? I noticed I didn't have my foot pointed right. You know, my foot was pointed here. It should have been pointed there. Okay, try it. How does it help you bat? Oh my gosh, it really improved my swing. Okay, what were you doing with your elbow versus what he was doing with his elbow? Well, my elbow was way down here. Well, now when you picked it up and when you bat it, what happened to the ball? It went further. I noticed I got a lot more power. Okay, cool. You noticed it. You saw it. You adjusted it. Now you're getting better. They need to see what's that, you know, piece that's going to help me try it and then notice it. You know, so that's that revision. And then the last one, like you said, that self-reflection, keeping track and sharing, so which is really wonderful. So find that page, keep it, and I think that um, it's gonna be very powerful. There. I want you to go back to your statements, agrees or disagrees. And I want you to really think about, and then I'll feel comfortable about checking this last box and <coughs> see how you answer, okay? Change anything that you think, oh, this was your initial thoughts, do you wanna change any of your answers? see some changes and, and, and I put them on there difficult for that reason because I wanted us to shift our mindset number one obvious was the biggest <coughs> one that I had a discrepancy on so hopefully you have now come to a realization of where you are in one because one was where I saw the biggest the difference. Two, there was a couple of people in different spots. All right. Formative assessment is done at the end of the learning process. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Disagree. disagree. They were. There were quite a few people who had agreed with that at the beginning, but now we know we are formatively assessing at all parts of a lesson, okay? Formative assessment is used only for the teacher to adjust instruction. Yes. yes. Who else is adjusting? The student. If the student's not adjusting, we're working really, really hard, and they're not working because they don't know what they should be doing, all right? Three, students are graded on every formative assessment. I'm a great everything. Let's grade it up. Disagree. Not everything. I mean, I had a great thing today, and you learned so much. That's okay. That's all right. Give yourself a break, okay? You're working really hard. You don't need to grade everything. All right. Four. Formative instruction and instruction go hand in hand. Agree. Right. If we formally assess and we don't do anything with it, what's the purpose of it? Why are we stopping and talking? Why are we doing thumbs up and down? Why are we doing that if nothing happens differently as a result? It's just happening because we think it's cool. Or, I, I know I needed to do that. They told me I needed to do it, so I did it. But how did I use it? And that's the big question. And that's the biggest one that I see focused out in the classroom that needs to happen. I'm seeing formative assessment. We're just not using it. So use it. Ready? 
lead you someplace differently. Um, formative assessment can help teachers differentiate instruction. Agreed. I think we all agree with that. It's just how, right? How do you do it? And we know we need to, okay? And then formative assessment can affect scores on summative assessment. Can, if we do it and do it well and adjust. Can we impact? Yes. When you gave them the feedback, did they make better models? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They will. When you started embedded exemplars, did they give you better products? Did, were they able to do better work when they had exemplars? Yeah. I heard when you started implementing Yeah, you didn't, but you will. And I'm going to come back to you because when you do it, you'll get it. All right? I want you to notice it, though. Okay? I want you to notice when you make the shift and when you embed these things, what impact does it make on learning? Okay? All right. I feel good. Let's go ahead and check three. Last part of the lesson. Do you feel good about three? Can you go back to your objectives and check that off if you feel very good? If you do not feel good, don't check it off. Because that will tell me I still need some work to do. I think you have it, but do you think you have it? Show me you do. If you check it, I know you're good. If you don't, I know I have to do some more work. All right. I'm good. All right. Here's the last part of our lesson. We are building up for you to look at a lesson that you will do and embed some formative assessment. I do not want you to walk away with a lack of types of formative assessments you can have. You have, if you are really using the tools your curriculum have, you have a plethora of them already built in. I mean, they're in the teacher wraps, they're in the notes, they're telling you what to do to differentiate. You have a ton at your hand already. They build them in at the back of the book, in the front of the book. They're always all there. But I wanted to give you, maybe your kids are not engaging with those and you wanted to do it in a different way. Well, I wanted to give you some other ways you can do it. I built in lots of different ones that you can utilize with kids who are young, who are kids who are older, high school kids, all kind of different ones that you have seen some today that you can try, right? Think about no hogs, no logs either. How do you know when what everybody's thinking? You need to know that, right? So they all, if you don't have 100% engagement at some point, how do you know? Beyond the question of a doubt, whether or not they're getting it. How do you know, beyond the question of a doubt, whether or not the kids are getting the, these learning targets that you have on the board? Write that right there on the sheet. How do I know, beyond a, a shadow of a doubt, whether or not each child gets the learning targets? How do I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt? Each child gets it. If you can answer that question, you have it in place. Ask yourself that question when you plan. Here are some samples in the packet. I'm going to give you some time to kind of go through, flag the ones you really think are helpful for you. If you don't like them, don't use them. If you like them and you think they work for you, <coughs> use them. Feel free to modify them. I want you to say, well, this won't work for me. Let me just throw it away. No, say, well, if I modify it in a small way, could it? Okay? So, like, for instance, there was a strategy that I had pointed out to a group of fifth grade teachers the other day, and it was um, about conversations, it was called. And it was using these questioning and listening stems that we have to have a deep conversation around a topic. And then what would happen is, at a certain point, I would say, stop, and I'd say, Pe uh, I want two people to move to the next station. And what we would do is, the original group would stay the same, and we would shift two people, two people, two people, two people. Well, the teacher thought that that might be, um, like, some of the kids would argue about who had to move. So I said, well, okay, well, don't just throw it away. Tell me, how can you prevent that argument? And then she thought a while. She said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and number the seats have them sit down, then I would either roll a dice or do a spinner and say, okay, person number one and two move. That way they don't know who's the mover. They're not going to argue about it. it I'm going to take that away as far as a choice and just say, that way there's no argument. I'm like, oh, you fixed the strategy. Now it works for you. Or another teacher said, oh, that's too much movement. You don't know my class. I said, well, how can you fix it? Hold up. Don't throw it away. And then she decided one person would move instead of two. 
Okay, that was doable in your situation. Good, try it like that. So if it doesn't work for you, don't throw it in the garbage. Think about, well, how can I fix it so it does, okay? So I want to give you the, you know, that thought. All right, here's some things that are on there. I'm going to give you some moments to explore, and then I'm going to turn you loose. We have whole cards, fist to five, some anecdotal notes, cards, and sticky notes that you can be using to gather that information. Questioning, learning response logs, discussion, which it'll tell you really like how to pose them. Self and peer assessment, laundry day, pretty interesting concept. You can look into that. Four corners, constructive quizzes, inside outside circle, think pair share, exit or admit slips. So exit slips, but then or some when you come in. Individual whiteboards, any kind of visual representative uh, uh, representations of rapid organizers like Ben, Frere, um, you know KWL, Web. We've all seen those double sided notes in practice presentations. On each of the um, slides, it will detail out what that strategy looks like. Kind of like poll cards of this. Instead of saying like thumbs up, thumbs down, you can do something like easy. I get it. I can do it myself. Okay, I need a little more help. Or it's hard, you know, I still need a lot of help. So it takes the thumbs up, down out of it, and it puts one <coughs> middle layer is, you know what, I just need a little more help. Okay? So you think about those. Um, fist to five is a great way to say, where are you in your learning? So when you're checking on those learning targets and you want to let them, the kids have it, you can ask a question and say, well, where are you? They give you one. They're beginning knowledge, right? Where are you with solving quadratic equations? <laughs> right here. Okay, yeah, I can use a little more practice. Like, let me own that. You know, I got it, but I'm, I'm shaky. Oh, wait. I still need some help. Three, you know. Four, I got this. I'm doing it all by myself. Five, I'm going to teach you somebody else. I got it, and I can teach you. <laughs> you know, I can own that. And when I do that really quick, what can that tell me about how I can move people around the room? If I have a five or a four, I probably can help somebody else, right? So right away, that quick formative assessment, okay, all my fives, stand up. I want you five, 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 and five. Go to those four corners, all right? If you had a, you know, a, a three, boo, 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 you know, you can move them around like that. So right away, I gauge what they think they know, and I use that information. So this is a cool, really way for me to let them own their learning and learn where they're at to party. Um, I'm going to not read through every one of these because I want you to do it. But I'm letting you know that it will tell you, you know, how you can use each one of these into what depth. I'm going to give you a few minutes to kind of look through ones you like. Go through and find at least three of them you really are feeling that you want to try. Because when you're about to move into adjusting and embedding your assessment, <laughs> I want you to have some you feel comfortable with, okay? So explore right now, take a few minutes to look at them, and find something you really like in the techniques, in the strategies. Read it, make sure you understand it, star it up. What's critical, what's, how do you do this? And make it your own. How could that look like in your class? You need to change it. self-assessment. If you haven't checked that out, kind of look at that one too, because it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy one to start with if you have not used those.
people feedback on quiz right away, but then you didn't score it yet, you give them the right their answers, and then write it again. They tear it in half, they hand it in. Then you're going to go over the answers right away. So, and they can still see whether or not they had gotten it right. Mm -hmm. Constructive quizzes did not occur to me. I did, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't use that when I taught. But when I saw that strategy, I loved it. I'm like, why didn't it occur to me? It's as simple as you fold a piece of paper in half. And you, if there's a 10 question quiz you're giving, you put your answers, but then on the second side of the paper, you put the same answers. You tear it in half, you hand in the first half to the teacher, you keep the second half. Right away, you can give immediate feedback on the quiz. They can score it themselves. You can talk about why the answer was right, why it was wrong, without waiting on, I have to go home, I have to grade it, and then I might take some time because i got a lot to do, and then let me give it back, and then days later, I don't even remember what we were talking about. Right away, boom, feedback. And you don't have to worry about them saying, you know, maybe not being honest on grading it themselves. You have it, and then, you know, they can get feedback right away. Simple thing, too. You know, it's so simple, but... I, I wish it was mine. <laughs> I wish I would have done that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We would go over the answers, no lie, like right away, right. but mm -hmm. they didn't have their answers in front of them, which, the, think about the value of actually being able to examine your answer there, which takes it to the next level. Even if you had something like a mathy thing you really wanted them to answer, you can just copy it twice, you know, and just like have that answer there or something. It's cool. <laughs> All right, let's do the last part of our learning. What's the last thing we need to learn today that our outcome? What's the last part of what we need to do? Yeah. Embed it, right? Like, if you don't know how to embed the formative assessment, we haven't done our job here today. If we do all this talk and all this discussion, and you go to your class and nothing changes, nothing looks different, then I didn't do my job. Because it says here that you need to embed a formative assessment in an upcoming lesson. You need to now apply this learning to real life, okay, to promote learning. So what we want to do is we need to get to this last one. So I want you to think about all that learning that happened today, but here's some guiding questions to help you along the way. I'm going to just turn you loose. I want to really help you to get there. When you consider a lesson that you're going to be presenting this next week, First, I want you to ask yourself, what are the learning targets? <clears throat> what am I trying to teach? What must kids learn? First thought, right? Don't just randomly pick one and say, yeah, we're going to do that. First of all, what am I trying to teach? Because maybe what I'm trying to teach tells me which one of these will work what? Better. Okay? Then, at what points in the lesson is it important to check for understanding of the learning targets? I want you to think about what we did today when I stepped out. How many times we stopped to check for understanding and what I decided to use at each point. I want you to think like that when you're planning. What do I need to do at this point in the lesson? What is a major understanding that they can't, you know, not just throw something in on something that's non-essential learning. At what point do I need to stop? This is an important learning right here. If they don't get this step, they won't move to this next step. So let me stop and formative assess here before it's too late, right? So I want you to think about critical moments. Then, how will you formally assess your students to gauge the understanding of those targets, right? Not just maybe once, but what are the important points and what am I going to do to do it? It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out thing. It could be something small. If you don't like one that's in this packet, don't use one. Maybe there's one you want to do that you know of. Maybe there's one that I did today that you want to try. Maybe you want to use conversation stems. You might want to try to do uh, talking chips, round robin. It could be as simple as that. Talking brain. 
What? There's a learning brain. A writing brain, a thinking brain. Who's doing the work? Them. Put the ownership on them so that way you'll see it back. Okay? And last but not least, how are you going to adjust that instruction to promote student learning? Once you glean the information, don't stop with the gathering. What are you going to do? So I want you to think through some teacher moves like, when I do this formative assessment, what am I doing? What am I looking for? And based on what I'm going to see, how am I going to respond? If I see I gave an anticipation guide and everybody got it wrong, what am I going to do? If everybody got it right, what am I going to do? If five kids misunderstood this concept, how is that going to change what I'm going to do? All right? It's a lot of thinking. But this is the point of application. Okay? So go ahead and I want you to feel free to get out your laptops, get out your guides, get out what you're going to do in your lesson plans and all those things. This is probably going to take some, you know, a few minutes here. We're going to probably work till about 12 o'clock. And then we're going to probably move into that room where you will continue to flesh these out with the support of your content experts. Okay? Your content experts are here to help you think through the hard stuff, right? I can't probably help you with trigonometry. They can. I'll help you with best practice. Don't ask me about trigonometry, but I can tell you how to give them a learning, right? That's why they're here to deepen it for you in your subject. But for right now, I want you to try it on your own. I'm removing the scaffold, and I'm letting you do it, right? I don't want to hold your hand and do it for you. So right now, go ahead, get it out, and I want you to do this. See if you can embed some of those informative assessments right now. I am formatively assessing you and seeing if you can do it. Because I need to be able to check that last box. Come on now, don't let me down here. This is it. Final countdown. Because you can later come in. Four, three. Hi, my name is Christy Wilhelmus. Today we're going to be talking about summary frames, a type of formative assessment. So ladies, this morning y'all met as a whole group and discussed about formative assessment. Uh, you also read an article um, this past week for Teach St. Bernard and responded to that article about types of formative assessment. One type of formative assessment that is very effective in classrooms is summary frames. Two components of the summary frames are descriptive and compare and contrast. After you've read the article about assessment of and assessment for learning, um, let's talk about what a descriptive summary frame would be that you could use with your students to help them also answer questions as they're re reading text. Descriptive, you would put a sentence frame either on an index card for your students or on a sheet of paper, whatever would be more you know, easier for you. And basically you would put a sentence frame and the students would fill in the parts of the sentence frame that were missing. So for a descriptive sentence frame, a blank is a kind of blank that. So what I thought is really great is that since we talked about formative assessment, we could say a formative assessment is a kind of, and what would you think a good answer for a student would be? It's kind of assessment. It's a type of assessment and does what? That measures what? What is your understanding of what you've done? Right. The How is a formative assessment different from a summative assessment? The formative you give consistently, and then summative you give at the end of the learning. Process. Formative is just quick little yeah. quizzes. Well, so temperature it's checks. And formative <clears throat> also is a way that students become involved in their own learning mm -hmm. because it's very short little intervals. And the students can also give feedback to you of, hey, I do understand this or I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. Um, summative, it's, summative is more, hey, I've taught this this whole, the last two weeks, and I'm going to learn from evaluating a student, did they master the material or not. But they really don't ha are not involved in that learning process when it comes to summative. It's basically a traditional grading assessment, where a formative, you can conference with the students and also get their feedback on what they feel is valuable. The next type of summary frame is compare contrast. So if we were to add that on right now, I'm going to let you put that on your index card. And tell me how you would compare and contrast two types of formative assessments. So assessment of learning and assessment for learning. And use your sentence frame. Assessment of learning and assessment for learning are similar in that they both do what? But they're different because they do. How are they different, the two? Okay, I'll give you about two seconds to do that real quick, and then we'll discuss that.
away about one second, guys. All right, if y'all want to swap cards and read with each other, uh, Root, as to what is the difference when you're comparing and contrasting assessment of and assessment for learning, um, and if you can read it out loud so that we can see what each other said. Summative and formative assessments are similar in that they both check for a student's understanding, but summative assessments are different in that they are that they are in the end, while formative are to check for understanding in the moment. Halima? Assessment <clears throat> of learning and for learning are similar in that they are both assessments for students, but they are different in the sense that of learning is when they get what they get out is of it. what they get out of it for learning is where they still need to go. So is where they still need to go. Our, our understanding of assessment of and for they're both valuable because you need to see have the students mastered the standards throughout the whole year or through a unit over time. Um, formative though is more like, hey, are you getting this? And if you're not, I'm going to have you sit with me and I'm going to see where you're making those mistakes and how I can help as an educator to get you to master that that short little amount of information at that time. And that one is four. And that is four, okay. yes. And of is our summative where so like our state assessment, the LEAP twenty twenty five would be yes. a summative assessment. Okay. Or a unit assessment or even a weekly assessment could be a summative assessment because you're measuring all of the information the students learn for that one week. Okay. Okay? Do you see that could be valuable in how you could apply that with your own students with sentence uh, summary frames? Mm -hmm. Do you think, I know you, you are a special education teacher, yeah. so for your students, those scaffolds are very important, mm -hmm. right? Even, not that they're not important for you, but for your students, yeah, they tend to be, they're struggling. Yeah. And so by providing them a sentence frame, you're not giving them the answers, but you are supporting their learning and helping them that they're not having to come up with all of these words on their own. Yeah. Okay? All right, thank y'all. Good. Toad. Through the Merrill Foundation with a group of teachers at Hamlin University from Minnesota and it's all about the river starts there and it ends with us and you get to hear what they see and experience and then they come down here and see what we experience and then some of our people go up there to see and do hands-on activities up there and so a couple of our teachers are actually in the film that you're gonna see. And what day um, is that? That is the 14th. Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday at nine and one um, and they will and your principal should have told you that they're going to show it on channel eight they're putting it on the um the local school board channel so you can show it on your class but you have to register yeah that's what you still have to register for it okay um and so if you want to talk more about that later but those are just two things that came up anybody else have anything from PD a good takeaway so we talked about um, answering questions with CER, um, and on Monday with my seventh grade, I'm going to unpack with them using like exemplars of how um, you can answer a question using like the claim evidence and reasoning. They're going out the mile, like we did. And what's good about claim this doing the CER? What we found when I went through and looked at the practice test for science, and it applies to your any of y'all that are going to have um, the state practice test that you've been released. <coughs> One of the questions might, might ask you, you know, what is this process? And then it's like, what is your evidence? And then, so our, in middle school, our kids will do the first part of constructive response. When it gets to the second part, they're tired already. They don't want to do it, or they don't know what they're looking for. So we unpacked it. We went through it. I had tons of examples for them to use that they can use with their class. So if any of you would like copies, because a lot of it is, you know, stuff that you can use with them. And... What's great about it is you don't start with the claim first. You have to look at the evidence before you can make a claim. So they can be done in any order. And you definitely have to start with the um, evidence before you do the claim. And it's always based on a question they have to answer or a problem they have to solve. So good, Maddie. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, just let me know how it goes. Let me know how it goes with them. Anybody else? We did incorporating literacy more into the math classroom. And specifically, when, while we're doing a gallery walk, my little group, we're talking about how to 
they know how to do it on paper, but now providing them with the skills to transfer that into technology and how we can do more modeling and showing them how to type in answers, ensure that they hit all the parts. Right. Yeah, because um, a lot of kids can tell you verbally and explain it to you verbally, but once you say, here's the paper, or type it up for me, or do a graph for me, they're like, I'm lost. So, um, yeah, I know that Stephanie and them, they're very excited about y'all having that experience now. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'm going to turn... Can you all this right now? <coughs> We'll turn it over to Stephanie now because this is, um, that was a great segue today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, so we did our debriefing. So our teacher showcase. Last session, we focused on the high school um, and brought in some good things that y'all were doing with the group work, the pair, the left student was the talker and the right student copied everything down and then you switched for the problems. So today, we're going to focus on a middle school math and um, exact, I had it open exactly how to incorporate that technology. So some of it, a lot of teachers, no matter what subject, um, are having difficulty with that transition with the students. So as you can see, and I will send this to you in your agenda, this teacher is in her third year, came from Teach St. Bernard program as well. Her students are up at the board, annotating the learning targets on Springboard Digital. She's there to assist her. While this is happening, a student is at the desk reading aloud to the class each learning target. Before this student went to the board, each student at their desk went into their own account and annotated their, their uh, learning targets as well. So they did it independently. Then this student came up to the board to put it in the class copy as another student was reading it out aloud. Okay? So they had their ind independent time. Then the next question after this, the teacher says, does anybody want to add something to this? And one little boy says, right here, I would circle the word right because he knew he had a rights, a justification after that. So they were able to, um, to use those learning targets as independent and shared practice. One of the major things along with writing from paper to technology is how do we get it all on one desk? It's a lot of things and a lot of math teachers want that the answers in the math book. This teacher has them in pairs already for the collaborative learning. The Chromebooks are there and the books are there. These students had an opportunity to choose what they wanted, whether they wanted Springboard Digital or the book. She also said at the beginning of the lesson, there's gonna be times where you have to do this problem in the book. Okay, so that way they didn't have, if they didn't have enough room in the Chromebook and things like that. But you can see they adjust to fit how they can maneuver with their partner um, at the desk. And then this young lady, um, I, you can't really see it, I snuck back in at the end of the class to help the teacher with a Springboard Digital question. This student's up at the board in that teacher copy answering the question, it's all in the equation. So that way it gets saved in the teacher copy and students can have access to that at home. So that's something that we'll be working on as a math department to get them into the Springboard Digital accounts. So that way they have access to practice in class and at home how to type from the book into that computer, so that may help you with your strategies at church today. Okay? Questions with that? Okay. And we like, we like, you know, we like showing you things that we've seen that have been, that really work in, um, in the classroom. So, like you said, we're going through the schools again this week, so when we come back in January, we'll have some more hot items for you to see. So, now we're going to start talking about compass. So I know some of you already had compass evaluations, already your observations, and have already met with your principals. But it's really important that you understand what's expected of you. So I purposely planned, and I took what we're going to do today, and I wrote all over it. Okay, so you should have a copy from last week that we ask you to bring to every session. If you don't, let me know so I can get you another copy. So today I want you to look at pages one and two. We'll start off with page one and two, and we'll see how far we get with this. You're going to write on this, you're going to highlight on this, so be prepared because there's a lot of things we're going to, um, a lot of things that we need to talk about on this. Stephanie, one over here. Two, I'm sorry. Thank you. You all good? Okay, so on page one. Page one. We're going to look at domain one, but we're going to um, spend time with 1C. 
setting instructional outcomes. Really important that you have outcomes set for what the instruction that you're going to be providing with the students that day. So I want you to, um, to read the first two paragraphs. I'll give you some time to read those first two paragraphs. Underline, highlight important things in there because um, instructional outcomes are very, very important and especially when we are writing those instructional outcomes out. The way that we write them is very, very important. So go ahead and I'll give you um, about three minutes to read both of those two little short paragraphs. Um, all right, so we're going to share out our formative assessments now. As you share out the formative assessment that you plan in your lesson next week, I want you to take us through that those guiding questions that we talked about and that you talked about this morning. So what question am I using? How does it connect to my learning target? How do I want them to answer this question? What strategy activity? How are they answering this question? The third question, how am I going to assess their learning? How do I know whether they're progressing toward the learning target? And then once I have this data, what's my plan to use the data? What do I do for the kids who don't have it? What do I do for the kids who do? For us listening, we're going to share out one thing that we can take in our classroom. So when Brian shares out, one of us will share, I really like this, I can use this here. Does that make sense? So who would like to start first? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the question that I'm going to use is uh, check your understanding and it's how does analyzing the context of a novel help you gain a greater understanding of the story? Um, we're getting ready to read To Kill a Mockingbird, and the lesson that we're doing on Monday involves context. So it's going to connect to my learning target, because my learning target requires students to identify historical, cultural, social, and geographical context of the novel. Um, I want students to answer, to be able to make the connection between the current events that were happening while Harper Lee was writing the novel and how those events shape what happened in the book and how those events shape her choices as a writer. Um, I was thinking of having this, giving, this, giving them a few minutes to prepare a response and then I want to use the inside-outside circle to have students discuss their responses in pairs while I'll be circulating and listening to their responses. Um, as far as for my students who get it, I was thinking of having a station after that activity where they'll get to utilize that knowledge on a deeper level. I'm not really sure what that's going to look like yet, so I'm open to suggestions. And then as far as my kids who don't get it, maybe taking that information and trying to help them apply it to their everyday life in a more modern context. They want to hear anything that they want to use in theirs, like strategy-wise. I mean, I like the, the discussion in the middle. That's not the end. It's like something after the discussion. Yeah, you're using the discussion to say, "All right, you got it. You guys are gonna go do this deeper level activity. You're still not sure. We're gonna do the scaffold activity here." I love that. That's cool. All right. Um, yeah. Um, the next lesson, um, or the one I'm thinking about, is uh, researching information online prep to get information on the Jim Crow laws. And um, the question that I was going to use is how, so where do I go to find information online on the Jim Crow laws, and then how do I organize the information that I find? Um, I want them to um, be able to take a certain topic that I give them on Jim Crow, and I'm thinking of maybe three different aspects of that and have them each uh, do a KWL chart on what they already know about that question, what more they want to learn how to know about it, and then the activity it has is to give them each an index card um, with their question, and then they have to, in groups, um, use their Chromebooks to research the information, to research, to find the answer to the question, and then show them how to um, fill out an index card that they can use in the future when they do research to answer the question and then to present it to the small group and then after that present it to the whole group so they can show where they got their information and then as they're kind of in a jigsaw situation mm -hmm. have them uh, write down the answers to the other questions that the other students present to them. Awesome. What's one thing you heard that you could take? <coughs> 
of the jigsaw yeah. idea um, getting them up and moving them on. my kids are a lot better when they're up and moving they're more invested in the behavior is better and the jigsaws are back there I know middle school now is coming into a novel as you guys you know, so middle school going to knowledge too. Jigsaw is a great way if you have a lot of information and you want to split it up. Like I have all of Jim Crow in 20 minutes, yeah. or I have 20 pages, but I really want to get them to do this springboard activity. Jigsaw is a great way where they become an expert on a topic, share out, it condenses the amount of time it takes for that information. So I love that strategy. And then even the one, the activity you're kind of taking us through, there are like four or five great form of assessment opportunities in there, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some that we heard that she could kind of check the pollster? Index card? The index card for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as well the research while you're walking around, they show up actually on target. So the research like where they're going, you can see do they actually know where to go. I was thinking also the KWL, that's a, that's a, First one, like the activating swing, where the first you know that pre existing knowledge, too. Awesome. Yeah. So, 212 is like, uh, made, like arguments and logos, pathos, mm -hmm. and ethos. So, my question is how can we create and develop a reasonable argument using persuasive appeals um, to persuade others in written form or oratory form as well? So, I'm going to focus on cause my students, I feel can grasp the oratory quicker than the written. So I'm gonna try and use like their skills at oratory to influence their written um, skills. And I have, um, I'm gonna do like thumbs up or thumb down polls like to kind of get that persuasive appeal knowledge down pack. So ethos, logos, and pathos are a pretty hard concept to learn and really see in, um, in action. So I'm gonna have a whole bunch of examples. And then um, the next one, I'm gonna do like a like a poll question or like a laundry day exercise, but instead of doing four, I'm just going to do three. And the ethos are going to be in one corner, the pathos are going to be in one corner, and then they're just going to kind of rotate. You know, five, five, ten minutes on, five, ten minutes off. And I think my students like the idea of being able to convince someone because, you know, I think that's interesting. So, um, poll questions, split them up, and then thumbs up, thumbs down card in the beginning. Ethos, pathos, logos is always my favorite thing. Yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, of course, what's one strategy that you heard that you could take in yours to your kids? The, the different centers, so mm -hmm. physically moving around. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Right. Okay, so I'm kind of changing up what I initially had, so I'm not actually <laughs> no fully <worries>. planned. <laughs> so uh, Wednesday, I want my eighth graders especially to prepare for me. So I want them to review the skills needed to demonstrate competency and then they're going to apply this knowledge that they're going to make an assessment. Um, and so the question, that's going to be the question is, can students edit based on the provided rubric and can they create an outline based on the rubric? Uh, so I want to do the laundry day strategy that we were discussing. And I think four stations would work best. So one, peer editing of the embedded assessment. Two, creating an outline of a writing prompt. Three, unpacking multiple choice questions. And four, learning how to effectively cite textual evidence, like part B questions. Uh, after I go through it, in my class we have this thing where they like put their heads down, and we do the number thing in English thing that was called this and five. So I think I do that, and I pair the people who have fours and fives with their heads down with the people who have ones and twos, and then maybe I kind of like revisit some of the stations by pairing them up so that they can like laundry that out before we actually go something you like. I like the idea of him putting the heads down before doing yeah. the ones you do yeah. before. Right. Because that's a good way like, of yeah. 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 That's cool. yeah. And you combine like what you saw them do with what they're telling you to do. Right. 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 Combine that when you're doing it right. is awesome. Okay, so I did my sixth grade social studies. Uh -huh. The biggest struggle they have when it comes to the test is just being able to use multiple sources together. So right now we're focusing a little bit more on um, like comparing and contrasting Sparta and Athens. So they have two different texts that they're going to be Actually, there's a couple more, but the two main ones we're going to focus on um, to identify details to compare and contrast. And they have a hard time taking details from one article and then from another and then applying them together, I think. So what I want them to, I guess, the main question would be what traits do they both have in common? 
and then put them on a sticky note to make a Venn diagram. And then once that's done, if they identify correct things, pair up those students with ones who maybe had a hard time locating things that were similar because they were so focused on one or the other. And have the student who was able to do it share the strategies they used with the other student. Um, so that way they can answer questions better on the test when it comes to using multiple sources. And I think that makes sense that they struggle with that in social studies. Because sixth grade English hasn't yet done a lot of like the two texts, writing about both texts, both their essays for the test so far. I've been just one text that's about to change. But it is like sixth grade social studies almost gets to certain things faster. It gets to A to C faster, it gets to compare and look at the things in front of faster. So you have to do a heavier lift and then you'll see to look at the right. phone. I saw that because each one's seventh grade class and I see that in my seventh grade class, their skills are their English hasn't met up with yeah. the skills need that and I do eighth grade English, so I'm trying to get you know yeah. I have to step back a little bit and kind of figure out how to do it. Okay, um, the question um, that I'm going to use is uh, explain how an author builds an argument. Um, so looking at um, new language, different kinds of evidence. Um, so essentially just going through uh, an op-ed piece in a newspaper and identifying first the parts of an argument and then um, going even deeper and looking at the different kinds of evidence that the author uses to support that argument um, and so I haven't figured it out but anyway like um, like a t-chart on the wall or something and I don't know post-it note I don't know using post-it notes or something um, to designate which piece of evidence is what kind How do you assess those students in your class? Can you assess all of them the same way? And your pencils down when you're finished. if y'all can start sharing with your neighbor. If you don't, if they have something you don't, go ahead and add it to your list. I kind of think it's completely mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think like parents share it for sure because some kids are going to be a little like early. Like if it's going to be like the mental block, like if like they're looking at paper and staring at it and they don't know how to start, and then give them a future. I was like, you're going to be wearing your neighbor with this Yeah, yeah, computer worksheet. Yeah, I said like create a model because some of them are more like artistic than others and so they want to express it with a model. Some people like to do worksheets and some will do worksheets and other people will. And is that okay? Yeah. Is that okay? As long as they are doing what? If they're understanding and you're filling it in. If they are. Okay, now let's share with you neighbor two of your best. So you're going to be able to measure their understanding through. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. But Building a model, 
So you always come back and address address their um, their maybe um misconceptions or okay. Is it okay if um I know I overheard you talking that some people like to draw it out. Somebody, you know, they do better with art. They can draw out their understanding of it. And as, as long as they meet the objective, is that okay? The outcome. As long as they meet the outcome. And that they can prove to you that they know, they understand the content. Okay? Um, good, good, good um, thinking. So did um, either one of you come up with something that the other one didn't have? She had a whiteboard thing creating models on there. Like now, more the physics stuff we're working on, like the models, much more helpful for a lot of my students because that the visual artist and people that need to see it, that need to draw it instead of writing it, it makes more connections for them. Because you know there are some people who need to learn more than one way. For example, myself, I have to learn. I have to write it, but I also have to do it. And I have to do it together. I can't write it and then two days from then come back and say, oh, now I'm going to do it. So some people need to do it both ways. So you may need to address it more than one way. But as long as you make sure that everybody in that room, you have some way to assess them for that outcome. Um,